I'm Justin Hi. Roberts of Biz News, and with me for today's Market Insights is Protea Capital Management's founder, Jean-Pierre Fister. Jean-Pierre, always good to touch base. There's been lots happening in China since we last spoke. The Evergrande saga has cooled somewhat. But are you still cautiously optimistic on the world's second largest economy, given the further developments since we last spoke around a month ago? Hi, Justin. Um, in broad terms, yes. Uh, over the long term, I do believe that there will be strong growth from China uh, economically. And that means strong growth from the companies that operate in that economy. It might be bumpy. We might see um, politicians saying that they want... <clears throat> excuse me, the prosperity to be shared, to be more common. Um, so in the short term, there might be volatility. And you see that with Evergrande as well, where now is coming out that uh, above, the, um, uh, above and beyond the debt that we know of, there could be more debt that was not recognized on their balance sheet. So in the short term, I'm still cautious, but in the long term, I'm still bullish on China. I don't believe that common prosperity takes us completely away from the basic principles of red capitalism. And I think it is in China's interest to make sure that shareholders in Chinese companies, whether they are listed in the US or in Hong Kong, whether they make use of VIE structures or not, uh, don't end up with donuts, don't end up with a big fat zero. That is not good for China. So long term, still bullish China. And Jean-Pierre, the correlation between GDP growth and stock market returns, that there is no such correlation there. And I was reading a tweet from Pitful Yun the other day. In the last 30 years, the China stock index has grown around 2.5% annually, despite often years of 10% plus GDP growth. How does that work? Yes, very interesting. So um, on that specific metric, uh, over the very long term, the companies of a stock exchange, if they show strong growth, it is because that they are growing in the economies that they're operating. The interesting thing is that for most of the stock exchanges, only around half of the companies or the profits of half the profits of the companies that are listed on any one exchange comes from the country in which uh, they are listed. So in the U.S., for instance, roughly half the profits that U.S. Is that companies make actually come from outside the U.S. In South Africa, it's less than half. So GDP, domestic product, not GNP, means that it's money made within a country. And because only half the stocks operate in the country in which they are listed, you don't get that strong correlation. So that's absolutely correct. What one misses, though, is if you just look at one number, GDP, or one number, a stock index performance, you are missing the details. And the important details are in the case of China, let's say, that back in the day you had the state-owned companies playing a very big role, which was in finance and utilities and telecommunications. The last decade, the IT companies have played a very big role. And if you look at the stock returns of the IT companies, there you can see the very strong growth of the Chinese economy because the growth hasn't been even. It's been the utilities and, and state-owned companies languishing but the capitalistic uh, in nature IT companies really growing strongly, and that's why their share prices have done very well. Uh, and you're missing that if you just look at the index performance. I was at the launch of the Cape Town Stock Exchange this morning, uh, which has been rebranded from Forex Africa Exchange. TWK Investments, an agriculture business worth around 1.4 billion rand, was listed too. Without putting too much focus on TWK Investments itself, What's your outlook for agriculture-related business as a theme in South Africa, the likes of Zida and businesses that derive parts of their earnings from the industry, such as Omnia? Hmm. I've got mixed feelings about agriculture. Uh, agriculture is called a, a primary sector. It's, it's where things begin, you know. <laughs> and uh, and um, it's not the, the um, transition of products from their basic nature into a more differentiated product. So, I mean... South Africa, for instance, has got a very large citrus industry. But an orange grown in South Africa and an orange grown in Spain is still basically an orange. Uh, there's not a lot of difference. So it's a commodity industry. And while our agricultural industry has done very well, it is primary, it is a commodity, and therefore for the long term, it is not normally associated with very high returns. You don't have a brand. I know there are some brands in citrus, but uh, uh, they're still trying to get a real premium. 
that brand when it comes to the price of the of the citrus that they sell. So long story short, I do think there's a very good story in South Africa regarding formalization of agriculture, bigger uh, farms making use of better technology, and that means that they are quite profitable. That is good as we professionalize commercial farming. Um, but over the long term, I'm not very bullish the sector as an outside investor. I would rather invest in a secondary or a tertiary sector where the brands really can command a pricing premium. And therefore, I don't have significant exposure in the funds that are management when it comes to primary uh, sectors of the economy. Just having a general outlook, September was a turbulent month for equity markets globally. Do you see this volatility continuing through the remainder of the year? Yes, look, there's, there's always volatility. Um, so uh, the irony is by expecting volatility uh, in itself, you would think there wouldn't be volatility because everyone's expecting it. So the prices are where they should be. But it's just the nature of markets that they go up and down, and sometimes they go up and down sharply in a short space of time, and that, that gets captured in things like the VIX index internationally or the SAVI index in South Africa, and that's an indication of higher uh, uh, volatility. So we've seen a very volatile past month. The all share index and stock markets globally dropping very sharply and then recovering again very sharply. So if you just look point to point, it looks like not much has happened in the month of September, but actually it's been it's been a bit of a roller coaster. Uh, so yes, the, the fourth quarter is normally associated with higher volatility and um, there's no reason to think this could be any different. But I don't have a firm expectation of the level of volatility. The, the VIX index will, will tell us, uh, but it does seem like uh, we're... we're, we're um, uh, we should expect, again, a, a period of heightened volatility because it's been actually a period of low volatility since the COVID sell-off of last year, March, to very recently. I was speaking to Magnus Haystack yesterday, and he said it's a good time to have some money or put some money into hedge funds, given the protection it affords investors when the equ equity markets go south. Between your three main funds, Jean-Pierre, what's your net exposure like at the moment? Or put differently, are you more defensive or more aggressive than the norm at this point in time. Hmm. So I'm glad to hear Magnus has that view. He has my cell phone number. I'm waiting for his call. <laughs> but uh, at the moment, we, we've come from relatively low levels of net exposure, therefore quite offensively, to in the last few weeks actually uh, increasing that net exposure. So um, we, we have found in this volatile period in September that there have been some good opportunities on the buy side, so we've bought some additional share exposure, and that pushes up your net exposure. But at the same time, we've also bought more put options. So what this means is if markets continue their recovery, we are well placed with our high net exposure to uh, take part in that and capture that. But if we see this heightened volatility that I said could happen in the fourth quarter, we also have more uh, put option protection. So what that means is our net exposure has gone up, but our gross exposure has gone up even more because we've got more positions on the long side and more protection on the short side via put options, both in South Africa and our Protea South Africa fund and globally in our Protea Global Hedge Fund. I can't recall us ever talking about the topic, and it's relatively vanilla. I tend to avoid these questions at all costs, Jean-Pierre. But what's your stance on cryptocurrencies? <laughs> mm, I'm not a crypto bull. I understand the construct, and I think the technology of blockchain is a wonderful technology and will find application when it comes to having open ledgers, when it comes to transactions that you need to make sure are captured somewhere or recorded somewhere in a way that people can't after the fact fiddle with those recordings. For well, that, blockchain is great. But the application of blockchain into cryptocurrencies, for me, um, is where it gets a bit carried away. Uh, I don't believe there's an intrinsic value of these cryptocurrencies. I can understand that if you have different countries with foreign exchange restrictions, hyperinflation, inflation, and people getting told by governments you're not allowed to move your money as you see fit, that it makes cryptocurrencies very popular. And at some point in time, maybe all the people who wanted to get involved in the cryptocurrencies will be involved in cryptocurrencies. And what then? So it has got these elements of a Ponzi scheme, uh, which means that for a long period of time, prices goes up, go up and it looks like value increases and then it all comes crashing down. So I have not invested in crypto myself. Our funds have not invested in crypto. It's a little bit of the Wild West and 
Our process is to look for gaps between price and value. And cryptocurrencies, in my opinion, don't have an inherent value. And therefore, for me, it's uninvestable. Lastly, the hard commodities, specifically the precious metals basket, iron ore and gold, have sharply backtracked over the past month. I know commodity prices are notoriously hard to predict, but are these signposts that this is near the end of the commodity cycle? It could be, yes, and it goes hand in hand with this uh, big question whether inflation is transitory or not. So commodity markets are telling us that maybe the inflation we are seeing currently in macroeconomic data is possibly transitory because the commodity price is already coming down, which would imply maybe inflation going forward will come down. Um, you mentioned precious metals. I mean, today we had uh, results coming from Northern Platinum Holdings. And it was very interesting to read the introduction where they speak specifically of rhodium. So similar to my comments previously about if you look at the index, you miss the details on a per stock basis. If you look at commodity indices, you miss some of the intricacies on a per commodity basis. So a lot of commodities are much lower, but something like rhodium still looks very bullish looking forward given constraints of supply. Something like coal is at record levels, which is good for, for coal mines. Uh, so there, there are some interesting things when it comes into the detail, but in general, I do think commodity companies and commodity prices are telling us that inflation might be transitory and that a lot of these commodities are settling down. And that's good for us, that we don't see an inflation shock like we saw in the 1970s. I'm just News.